Hello and welcome to the second part of our show on Europe's agriculture. After Belgium, we are in France at the Château de Chambord, one of the most magnificent Renaissance castles in the country. It's in the Loire Valley, a region where it's produced prestigious wines, such as Cheverny or Sancerre and Pouilly Fumé, further to the east. Wine, of course, very important for France as it's exported around the world. Trade agreements between Europe and other blocs are, of course, crucial in order to increase profits for the sector. In the report coming up, Mathilde Benezet and Luc Brown take a look at two symbols of French cuisine and gastronomy, foie gras and cognac. But how do these trade agreements affect their business and what's the impact on domestic production? Here's their report. A reset in transatlantic relations, with smiles returning to Brussels despite the masks. With Donald Trump gone, so too are many of the Trump-era trade barriers. The Biden administration suspending the Trump tax on European wines and spirits for five years. That's a relief in the French town of Cognac. 50% of the luxury liquor is exported to the US. Being taxed 25% is a massive obstacle. The risk is that you see part of or all the taxes passed on to the consumer through the price, and then it's up to the customer to decide. When the consumer's out shopping and they have a choice to make, then the price could get so high that they refuse to pay. Hennessy is one of the most prestigious cognac producers. 99% of the brandy bottled here is destined to be sold overseas meaning the EU's external trade deals are vital. The EU is an important market for us, and we export to 160 countries. We need easy access to those markets without tariff barriers. Cognac has benefited from the EU's recent deals with Japan, Singapore and Vietnam. The sales of Hennessy have increased 20% in the past year, and the company has its sights set on new markets. We are working with the EU to look at different markets, to see where we can gain in fluidity in the market and so gain a foothold there. One example at the moment is India for a simple reason. Taxation there is at 150 percent, so we would like negotiations to be reopened there. France's reputation for fine wines and gourmet food has a financial windfall. Its geographic origin labels represent 4.3 billion euros in sales each year. Foie gras from the southwest is one of them. Although 80% of the Espinay foie gras is consumed domestically, Japan is the third biggest market. The EU's free trade deal with Japan that began in 2019 is a boon. There's no issue of seasonal dependent sales like there is in France, so the flow of trade is a lot more stable throughout the year. Whereas in France, the majority of sales are during the end of year festivities, and we sell almost nothing in the first six months. For the Espinay company, exports are only 5% of sales. But that represents a reliable revenue stream for a sector that's been rocked by outbreaks of avian flu in recent years. The Japan deal known as JEFTA has helped mitigate the impact. What's important with the deals is that they outline the geographic spread of a disease. That means that not all the French foie gras is blocked from going to Japan if there is an outbreak in a specific region. Rather, it outlines that poultry from the affected areas cannot be exported, but regions where there have been no cases can be exported. The EU's trade deals also ensure that European produce, bearing its unique protected origin labels, can't be imitated overseas. If we didn't have the Jefta deal, someone who produces foie gras in Australia could just say it comes from the southwest of France and then sell it in Japan with no problem. But thanks to the Jefta deal, that's no longer possible because the foie gras from southwest France label is also protected in Japan. Protection and promotion, that's what the EU's trade deals mean for France's 250 protected origin labels, providing potential growth for France's agri-food sector, which is already an export champion, selling 61 billion euros abroad. We can now talk to Jérémy Dessin. He's a European Member of Parliament with the centrist bloc Renew. That's the bloc with President Emmanuel Macron's troops. Jérémy Dessin, hello. Bonjour. So you're a member of this commission that's been working hard on the new uh, common agricultural policy for Europe. Tell me the key points for the reform and for this cap for the years to come. 
There was a more pragmatic approach to environmental issues in the agreed cap, with more measures that include incentives and taking into consideration the farmer's position. The other main point was how the aid is distributed, where we're seeing it given to the active farmers themselves rather than paid according to the number of hectares they have. That will be helpful to overcome a problem that's already on the horizon, the need to encourage a new generation of farmers, to encourage young people to become farmers. But many farmers are also worried about these international trade deals being agreed with blocs such as South America, with Mercosur. You're a member of the Commission for international uh, commerce. Do you think that farmers should be worried? Of course I understand the farmer's position. After all, I am a farmer. I recognise the risks it creates. The answer that we've tried to find in the EU's International Trade Commission is to ensure that in future trade deals, agriculture and food issues to be treated in a specific framework. We don't want food and farming to be used as a bartering tool. It's also a question of coherence. Europe can't decide to implement its own Green Deal on the one hand, and then on the other hand sign the Mercosur deal. You can't impose on our farmers strict regulations that aren't then demanded of the partners we trade with. You want greener agricultural policies on a European level only if it means more revenue for farmers. Can you explain that? If the large majority of farmers continue to see their incomes fall, or at the very least they don't increase, then we'll never achieve the environmental improvements that Europe wants. The only way to get any results is to give farmers the tools they need. And I think that the CAP that we voted for, this CAP, should allow us to meet those goals. But even then, it comes down to member states implementing the measures, and then we'll see whether the funds allow the objectives to be met. I've seen that you disagree quite a lot with Green Party MPs in Europe. Can you explain why there are so many differences between your views and their views when it comes to defending the environment and protecting farmers? The Green parties always ask for more. They're never satisfied with anything. They don't even recognise the efforts that we've already made and that we've already agreed to, efforts that will allow us to move forward. I really think they're contemptuous of what farmers do, and I think that's a great shame. Maybe some people don't think farmers are changing fast enough, but we have made huge leaps. And I think that our agriculture here in Europe is the best, the cleanest, the healthiest, the most monitored in the world. Well, let's see what the Greens uh, think of all of this. We'll have a, a representative from their movement later on in the show. Jeremy Dossel, thank you very much. Thank you. We're now going to turn to Tunisia. The country has a special partnership with the European Union, an association agreement, and there's a lot of business between the two partners, as you'll see in this report by our correspondent, Lilia Blaise. After two years without a job, Imen, an engineer, has begun raising camels in the south of Tunisia, in the region of Ben Gerden, bordering Libya. This is the fattening up season. I raise and I sell the camels. They are for the meat market. I have 22 animals in total. 35% of its investment was covered by the European Union program Protofil, which supports agriculture and pastoral development projects in this arid Tunisian region. At the beginning, I was very scared when I made the budget for this project. 56,000 dinars is a lot, and I come from a fairly modest family. The program supported me financially and gave me advice on things like what kind of hay to buy and how often to feed the animals and so on. It's welcome support in a region where unemployment is 24%. In 2012, Tunisia and the EU established a privileged partnership, and since 2016, the two have been negotiating a comprehensive free trade agreement. A few kilometers away, Selma, a project coordinator with Protofil, checks in with another project beneficiary, a shepherd. You're managing with the money? Everything okay? Yes, I'm buying hay. She wants to help him and Imen to advance their projects. We're currently working with a slaughterhouse in Ben Garden. We're working according to European standards, so that if we slaughter camels, for example, 
we could perhaps export the meat to the European Union. The EU invested 185 million euros in loans for the raw materials sector in Tunisia, bringing along strict health standards. But export markets don't always fully recognize the value of Tunisian products, their authenticity and traditional production techniques. In Benzert, this company produces sun-dried tomatoes for Italy using an age-old method. I would have loved to do my own packaging, but now it goes, gets mixed with other products by other people, and is sold in Italy as if it was an Italian product. I don't get any help. I wanted to have an Italian or European partner who could help me financially to make a packaging unit. The EU promotes raw agricultural production, but not necessarily the development of processed goods. In the Tabarka region in the northwest, this farmer is hoping to bring together an organic community financed by Europe. But this strawberry farmer is having trouble getting in good prices for his organic foods. The state and the EU need to provide us with the resources. We don't really need money. We have more of a need for serious people who provide us distribution mechanisms, either equipment or to transport the goods or to distribute them at a large scale. Leith bin Bashar, who can help through his platform's networks, would also like more exchanges of best practices with the European Union. Our European friends need to know how to support us, like they help the other countries, which meet regulations. This way, we can avoid the complexity of European regulations, which took 40 years to shape. It's a European agricultural policy aimed at integrating Tunisia even more fully into the European market. One more step in a decades-long process. We are now near Blois in the Loire Valley in an organic farm and we are joined by Claude Gruffa. Hello Claude. Hello. You are a European MP for the Greens and also the former president of Biocop, which is the largest uh, chain of organic food stores mm. here in France. How do you think Europe should protect its farmers? Can we say that Europe is heading in the right direction when it comes to having farming that protects its land? that farming and food are produced at a local level, that different regions and countries produce enough food for themselves. I don't think so. What's going to happen is that we're going to continue financing industrial farming to the detriment of small-scale farming that's reinvesting in local regions and that protects a wide variety of landscapes. Europe is trying to increase business with uh, blocks abroad. We've got the Mercosur deal uh, with South American nations, various deals. Do you think these are a threat to small farmers like here and organic farms? No. no, competition will lead to greater concentration of farms and a deterioration of small-scale farming communities on both sides of the Atlantic. That will encourage farmers over there to export more, and the same will be true here. That will damage the fertility of the soil. And it will lead to deforestation, because agriculture in Mercosur is possible due to deforestation. Every three minutes, forests the size of a football pitch is cut down to make way for industrial agriculture. So, it's a bad deal. Well, we spoke with the father and son running this farm, and they explained to us why they are worried by these deals and what they're hoping from Europe. Take a listen. There's going to be a massive amount of meat imports, and it will be at a price that undercuts us. It will be agricultural dumping. The consequence for us will be that even in local markets, we'll see prices fall in Europe and in France. In Europe, we have one of the biggest agricultural markets in the world, and it's a real shame that we want to trash that just to go and sell a few other products overseas. As I said earlier, you are the former president of BioCup, so you know a lot about uh, locally sourced products. Do you think that's maybe an answer to the crisis, a way to help these small farmers? 
If they want a future, small farms, local farms need to be organized with all the different actors and work in cooperation. In that way, each one can move forward and progress and so that in the long term they can continue to exist economically. If we want to keep our promise to the consumer about quality, about traceability, sourcing, our human values, the social values of a project and so on, then you have to build something that's for the long term. With these uh, international trade deals such as Mercosur, uh, France and other countries are saying that they want to be able to check the quality of the products coming into uh, Europe uh, with specific standards, also regarding animal welfare, the protection of the environment. Is it possible, do you think? In the Mercosur deal, the only criteria that touches on quality is to do with the slaughterhouses. There are no others. When it comes to all the other factors that have to do with rearing livestock, they're not discussed at all in the deal. In Europe, every stage is monitored very strictly. We can't use hormones to encourage growth. The use of genetically modified crops is very limited. And animal welfare is an issue that's increasingly important. And in the Mercosur deal, none of these criteria are included. And if the deal doesn't have those criteria, then who will check them? If there's nothing written down, then no one will check anything. So we'll just allow hormone beef into Europe, just like it was the case with the CETA deal with Canada. And we know that consumers don't want that. But they won't even be able to know because it won't be marked on the label. And that's a serious problem. Claude Gruffin, European MP with the Greens, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's the end of our Europe show on agriculture. From these bucolic and beautiful vineyards of Sancerre, thank you all for watching. See you soon and stay with us on France 24 for always more international news.